We're going to bring y'all into our huddle. Today is Wednesday, April 30th, 2014, and you are in the Warriors Huddle with me, Brad. With me, as always, my boy, producer Scott. Scott here. Scotty, a lot of politics have been dropping since the last time we recorded, huh? Yeah, there's a lot of basketball that was played, too, but definitely the politics are overshadowing the basketball on this one. I'm just glad you gave me some love on my comment. I thought you were going to just completely undermine me and house it and just go right towards the basketball. So nicely handled on your side. You're absolutely right. The Warriors, in fact, are headed towards a huge Game 6 on Thursday. And I was right. There's been a lot of off-the-court issues as well. So you know we got big things to talk about. In the Warriors update, Nashville will go through all the storylines, all the things that have popped up in Games 3, 4, and 5. And we'll also cover all the unexpected but pretty damn important off-the-court issues that have also made their way to the nation's uh, forefront since the last time we were under the mics. Now, quick show note before we get to any of that. Uber remains our lone sponsor. This thing is still my favorite app, man. If uh, you download it to your phone, you don't feel like going through the drama to find a cab or the money to pay for it, press a button and a car will come to you. Playoff time is a great time to sign up for Uber. And when you do, <laughs> look for the promo code box, enter the word HUDDLE, you'll get $30 off your first ride. That was polished, boy. Playoff time, great time. Do you work on that or just come to you right there? That was oh natural. <laughs> nice, man. Nicely handled. Uh, quick pass scores, current standings before we get into the Warriors update. A game three, Clipper win, 98-96. A game that ended on a pretty damn frustrating last second miss by Steph Curry. A game four, 118-97, Molly Wapping win by the Warriors. A game I had the pleasure of going to. And then a game five loss, 103-113 just last night. Sirius now finds itself tied 3-2, Clippers in the league. But it returns to Oakland this Thursday, uh, where the Warriors will have a chance to tie it up at three and send it off to a Game 7 on Saturday. Uh, Let's jump in, man, because there is so much stuff ahead of us. And why don't we start with the lead story that has been circulating its way, not just through our nation's media, apparently through everybody's. That's uh, Donald Sterling's amazing racist ass uh, for the maybe, what, two people out there who've lived under a rock and don't know what the hell happened. D. Sterling was apparently taped by his uh, girlfriend, a girl who's what, 20 to 30,000 years younger than, uh, than Donald Sterling is? You know, it came out today, actually, that the woman's lawyer said that it was um, a mutually agreed upon taping of that conversation. No. Yes, that, that is what her lawyer has said, that he knew he was being taped no, when he said that. That can't possibly And, and she be also true. came out and said that they were not having sexual relations. <laughs> All right, well, so, breaking news for me. I kind of wish you had told me that before I had said this on the mic and not look stupid, but nicely played, as opposed to belaboring the obvious. I am sure a lot of us have read some of these quotes, but I'm also equally sure a lot of people haven't actually heard them coming out of his mouth. And there's something that's even more compelling about hearing this racist bastard drop these things, especially if he actually knew he was being taped. So without further ado, here are some of the choice cuts I pulled from it. Just for full clarity, this was a nine-minute interview. We're not going to play the full nine minutes. And there's a a 15-minute version out there. So this is an edit of the edit of the edit, right? So, you know, take that in mind, but uh, here's here's Donald. I'm not broadcasting anything. pictures with minorities. Why? What's wrong with minorities? What's wrong with black people? Nothing. nothing, nothing. What's wrong with these families? It's like talking to an enemy. People call you and tell you that I have black people on my Instagram, and it bothers you. Yeah, it bothers me a lot that you want to broadcast that you're associating with black people. Do you have to? You want me to have hate towards black people? I don't want you to have hate. That's what people do. They turn things around. I want you to love them privately in your whole life. Every day you could be with them. Every single day of your life. But they're not in public? So why publicize it on on the Instagram and and why bring it to my games? Why bring the black people to the games? I'm sorry that you still have people around you that are full of racism and hate in their hearts. I'm sorry that you're still racist in your heart. I'm sorry that you live in a world that still... How about, the, how about your whole life? Every day. You could do whatever you want. You could sleep with them. You could bring them in. You could do whatever you want. The little I ask you is not to promote it on that and, and not to bring them to my games. I... I saw someone I admire. I admire Magic Johnson. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Okay. 
she made a lot of changes for his community, for the world, for the people, for the minorities. He's helped a lot of people. Why are you forcing this down my throat? I'm finished talking to you. I have nothing more to say. And I took a picture with someone I admire. Good. And he happens to be black, and I'm sorry. I, I think it's nice that you admire him. I know him well, and he should be admired. And I'm just saying that it's too bad you can't admire him privately. And, and during your entire f***ing life, your whole life, admire him. Bring him here. Feed him. F*** him. I don't care. You can do anything. But don't put him on an Instagram so the world has to see, so they have to call me. And don't bring him into my games, okay? Oh, my God, man. What a piece of s***. Unbelievable. It's like you said, I mean, you read the quotes in the articles, and they're terrible. I yeah. mean, absolutely horrible. And then you, you listen to the quotes, the actual audio of it, and it is that much worse. It, it's really just disgusting. And it's the vocal inflections, and when he starts getting momentum, you know, like he'll slow down, and then you can tell something just fires him up. Oh, no, I have to tell you this. Which is why I am shocked to hear that they're suggesting that he knew that he was being taped. Now, a portion of me thinks it's a legal ploy because it's illegal to tape people without their knowledge, so it makes sense that her In attorney... California. Right. So it makes sense that her attorney would come out here and kind of assert, no, 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 he knew it, otherwise she's going to be facing legal charges. The other side of that coin, you listen to this, if this fool... I mean, say what you want about Donald. Terrible, terrible human being. But you don't make that type of money by being stupid. If he knew he was being taped and he dropped these kind of filthy hate-mongering comments, what the hell is going on, man? How could that be? We'll go over the guy's past, but the fact that he's gotten away with this type of behavior and these type of comments for so long... That's interesting, yeah. Maybe he truly is one of these guys who is so at such a high power level that he thinks he can get away with anything. It's a very interesting take, sure. Sure, t yeah, sure tape me. I don't right. care. I've said stuff before. He has said stuff right. under oath. In a deposition I mean, before. Do you remember that movie, A Few Good Men? Yeah. And, they, you know, and it's got the big line at the end, you can't handle the truth, and they get Jack Nicholson because his character thinks that he's so far above everything that he will tell you exactly how he feels, and too bad if you don't agree with it because I'm above the entire fray. It's positive. I mean, what you're saying there could kind of match up with what the hell Donald did. And you know, before we get any further, let's talk about his past. Scott is 100% right. In fact, so right, we did a segment on how filthy uh, racist this dude was back in January of last year. It was in the seventh episode that we ever recorded. That's, and it was random as hell. We were playing the Clippers. I hated him so much. I wanted to talk about Donald Sterling. What that thing pointed out is as follows. In 2006, the United States Department of Justice accused him of uh, not renting to Hispanics because, quote, he said that Hispanics smoke, drink, and just hang around the building, and that he didn't rent to African Americans because, as he put it, quote, black tenants smell and attract vermin. That wasn't the end of it, Scotty. Also, in 2009, he was sued by former uh, NBA great and former GM of the Clippers, Elgin Baylor, for racial discrimination. Here's what Baylor accused Sterling of doing, of telling Baylor that he wanted to fill his team with, quote, poor black boys from the South and a white head coach, that Sterling had a, quote, vision of a Southern plantation type structure, and that former players, Sam Cassell, Elton Brand, and Corey Maggette, had told them that Donald Sterling would bring women into the locker room after games and while the players were showering, and then he would make comments to those women's like, quote, look at those beautiful black bodies. And, and that's not even to mention the fact that in the early 2000s, he had a sex harassment case brought against yeah. him. And under oath in a deposition, which you can't get more on the record than that. That's exactly he right. He went on to say like extremely sexist remarks and, and talked about really the horrible way he treated women. So this uh, one of our listeners actually sent us an article uh, written by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar about the Sterling situation. Props to Josh out in Chicago. Yep. And it, it's a good read, but one of the things that Kareem says is we really need to be outraged or yeah. at the fact that we weren't more outraged in the past. He's absolutely right. And some of that anger should be directed towards our boy D. Stern. I mean, he knew this stuff was there. In fact, one of the reasons I wanted to play the quotes is that it's different between reading this stuff, because a lot of people did, and hearing it. 
You know, like the big difference was that TMZ caught this stupid ass on tape. Now we're hearing this hate spewing out of his mouth and it's getting all these these guttural reactions. But we knew about this stuff. I mean, we absolutely did. This should have been acted on far, far uh, earlier, but it is what it is. Now, there have been reactions since now. Uh, some of them measured, some not so measured. Let's start with the class act of the NBA and the subject of some of Filthy Sterling's hatred, Magic Johnson. Here's what Magic had to say after hearing the quotes. You can't understand how hurt I was. And also, I was hurt for all African Americans and all minorities. Because when a man who owns a team in the NBA, and Donald Sterling has had issues in the past, so this is not the first time. And... I've known Donald, uh, one of the first men I met when I came to L.A. Dr. Buss took me to his annual Malibu beach party. Actually, my first week in L.A. Then I met with Donald two or three times. He wanted to discuss the issues with his Clipper team. So I, I had a friendship with him. So for him to then make these comments or alleged comments uh, about myself as well as other uh, African Americans and minorities, there's no place in our society for it. There's no place in our league because uh, we all get along. We all play with different uh, races of people when you're in sports. That's what makes sports so beautiful. You Magic said it pretty well. Snoop was a little angrier. Here's Snoop. A message to the mother on the Clippers. You bitch ass redneck white bread chicken mother you. Your mama and everything connected to you, you racist piece of shit. Fuck you. I've always been a Snoop fan, but I haven't been like actively entertained by him for what? Like, you know, since like late 90s, like I haven't heard anything by him. Let me just go ahead and say I loved that clip. That was really well said by him. A lot of, a lot of passion there. I don't know if we necessarily want to be fighting racism with racism, but I think he, he captured a lot of people's raw emotion when they first heard this. I just wish he had mixed in a couple more uh, curse words. He's going after my record. Like, How many nasty words can you fit into a 17-second clip? Each one of them justified and each one of them entertaining to me. Uh, now, there's been some action since this thing went down. Adam Silver stepped up and uh, his reaction actually got him this great nickname I read on ESPN, the Silver Hammer, which I thought was pretty that's awesome. That's terrible. I thought it was really? pretty Did awesome. You, you really think that's good? Yes. I, why would I tell you that I thought it was awesome if I didn't think it was good? What is not awesome about the Silver Hammer? Is that a Thor reference? I hope not. I think it's just a reference to his last name and the fact that he dropped hammer on this guy. Uh, that's weak. <laughs> You're terrible. You know nothing about great nicknames. Um, anyways, what the silver hammer was able to do is he leveled the deepest and possibly, uh, or the, the deepest and nastiest possible reaction that he could on D. Sterling. He's banned him from life, so he can never come back to an NBA game for as long as he lives, which is what, at least another three months. And then he's also supposedly getting ready to try to force him out of uh, his ownership. They're going to actually get him to sell the team. What was your reaction? Yeah, I mean, this was basically as much as he could do given the parameters he was working with. And I think it was a smart move by him. So he also fined him $2.5 million. Oh, that's right, sure. And the, the NBA Constitution has this strange catch-all... Like ethical clause. Ethical clause right? yeah. where basically... You know, I haven't actually read the the straight up language of it from, but from what I gather, it kind of allows them to say like, you really screwed up on this one. Sure. And in those scenarios, you can find them up to two point five million. So Silver stayed within that, which was a smart move because one thing we know about Sterling too is that guy is litigious. He will go ahead and bring this to court. Like I'm sure that he's not going to go down easy on this. Yeah. And. So I, I think it was a smart move to kind of basically make sure you stayed within the parameters while doing as much as you could. I had a few takes on Sterling or the Silver Hammers move. Uh, one, I thought it was the right one. Um, I, you know, everyone's applauding him. He deserves that praise. Sterling stepped up and dropped, you know, basically bitch slapped this guy in basketball terms. And that's Silver did. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Silver did. It, is it good that I'm all fired up about a nickname and then immediately start calling him somebody else? Um, so one right move, well delivered, and he immediately already made his legacy. If Adam Silver doesn't do anything else ever as the commissioner, he will still be known as a remarkably good commissioner because of the way he handled this. Eighty Two, days in, uh, yeah, I mean just immediately, you know. Two, 
I think that this was an easy call. You know, I mean, we were praising him, and again, he deserves the praise, but I think once he recognized that he had all of the public behind him, once he recognized that he had the entire NBA behind him, it wasn't very hard. I think he just went to his legal team and said, look, go through the Constitution, you come back and you tell me what is the nastiest thing I can do to this guy, and that is exactly what the hell I'm going to do to him. You know? Yeah, well, I think the big test comes with Silver pressuring the owners to actually kick him out. Sure. Because that's what, at the end of the day, that's what everyone is really looking for. I, I mean, there's no way that one of the owners is stupid enough to actually go on record and say, no, I'm voting against it. I mean, Mark Cuban has already he's expressed, close, right? Right. He's expressed some, uh, some concern where if they put down the legal precedent that someone can be forced to sell, he doesn't want to put that on there. But I, I, just given what the sports environment is and the way everyone's watching, I think that they're going to get the votes. You've hit the nail on the head as far as uh, Sterling being litigious. He's not, I mean, they can vote anything they want. There's no way he's just going to wave the white flag and immediately put this thing up for sale. So this story isn't done by a damn long shot, but he yeah. did react pretty well. And, and what, what's interesting, and I had I talked with a friend about this today, is I think uh, Sterling may try to tie this up as long as possible so he doesn't have to pay a huge tax bill because sure. he huh. bought this team for $12 million. Right. It's going to sell for potentially $1 billion. Yep. That is a huge capital gain tax right there. And if he can get this tied up in litigation long enough and he dies, That's it probably goes to his wife. No estate tax yep. needs to be paid there. So uh, that's maybe one reason. I think it was KNBR. I heard them talking about the exact same thing you said, that the original price when they were still in San Diego was like 12, 14 million, something like that, but that he's part of a group. So really all he spent was 3 million, that it's currently being valued at a billion at least, and that if he sold tomorrow at that mark, he stands to make $997 million on the, sh on the sale of this team, which is no joke. Now that said, that makes it seem like he's going to walk away happy, but this dude already has a hell of money. You know, I think what he wants is that public persona. He wants to be seen as the owner of the Clippers. So, I mean, in addition to any tax implications, if he's fighting this thing, I think that's why. You know, he, he does not want to give this crap up, especially if he's the pompous prick that we were just, you know, assuming that he was. If he knew that he was being taped and he drops all these takes. Now, this stuff... Everybody knows. We can argue back and forth if they wanted to, to handle it differently. I think that they've handled it perfectly. Here's the question I have for you, because really the main thing I care about, or at least for this podcast, the thing I care the most about is how this affects the series. You know, we are now going forward. Uh, what do you think? Does this Sterling thing still affect us? Did it affect us? What, what's its actual uh, interaction with the series itself? I mean, that's a, a large question, and I think it can be broken down into a lot of smaller moments. I mean, yeah. no, the first one is how the players reacted, the coaches reacted, whether or not more of a protest should have been made. You had the Clippers in Game 4 turn their jerseys inside out or their shooting shirts inside out. I thought that was super weak, yeah. and I thought that the players on both sides should have done a lot more. Yeah. This was a huge teaching moment for the entire world Absolutely on right. how to react to racism. And it was just so much larger than basketball that the idea of turning your shirt inside out was so easy. Sure. I, I'm fairly certain that you didn't answer the question at all, but it was an awesome take. So let me chase down what you said, and then I'll answer my own goddamn question. Um, protest. I'm pretty sure I said that was a huge, overbroad question that yeah, needed and to just, be broken down. And then just immediately gave yourself another question and chased that one down. Nicely done. I will handle my own broad question. But like I said, you're right on the protest. Um, and I'm stealing this from KNBR, but what they pointed out when I was coming into work the following day is that we're in a totally different culture now. You look back on the black rights, um, or the civil rights movement, I should say, or like uh, Muhammad Ali. There were athletes in the past who literally gave up personal gain to make these really large political statements. It was part of our culture. We haven't had one of those moments for years, and what I think this one illustrates is that's no longer the go-to move. You know, and it, this doesn't just end with the Clippers and the Warriors. Obviously, this affects the entire damn league. If we had woken up the morning after Sterling's comments went public, and the first game, I believe, was your Wizards and the Bulls, we all tune in, and those guys don't show up. Then the second game, nobody shows up. Then the Warriors-Clippers game, nobody shows up. You are talking about a huge message, a huge one, one that wasn't made and one that I guess will never be made. Now, that said, that's me taking shots at the players. Let me make it a little bit more personal. The fans also could have taken a message. And when I say personal, I mean it. I had a ticket to game four. 
if we hadn't shown up, if that was an empty uh, arena, we would have been making a very similar message. I didn't think about it at all, Scott. I showed up. You went. I did. And and at no point did I even consider not showing up. Now I really? went and I booed and I you know and I did everything I possibly could. In fact, I made a fool of myself and a reaction I'm gonna have to get your opinion on later. But uh, it's not fair for me to cast all these dispersions at the players for not uh, standing up for their what they think is right when I didn't do it either. You know. Well, yeah, and I and yeah, I, I certainly watched the game, yeah. but I I guess uh, to play my own devil's advocate here, they had a short amount of time to kind of put a protest together and sort of sort everything out. Yep. So it may be unrealistic to say in the less than 24 hours, you guys have to figure out how you're going to handle this thing. I also think they wanted to give Adam Silver the chance to bring down the punishment that he was going to bring down and see whether or not they felt that that was adequate before actually making their next move. I see what you mean. I disagree with that. If they wanted to sit, it wouldn't have taken you know that much organization. Even just the Clippers or any of those teams collectively could have said, look, this cannot be stood for. I'm not going to play in a league. That but don't you think they need to let... Don't you think they need to let Adam Silver come no. down with his punishment? I think that Adam Silver needed to come up with his own reaction. The players could have come up with their own reaction as well. You know, I mean, the, if they decided to sit and then Silver comes out and does what he does, and then they, they come back, as they obviously would have, then that just makes their message even heavier. Now, going back to my original well, question. No, I don't, I don't want to go to your question yet. I want to stay on this for one second longer because the Warriors did have protest plans for Game 5. Yeah, they did. Um, they were going to see how Adam Silver reacted, and then... There was this whole idea that they hatched in the shoot around that the the ball was going to be thrown up in the air for the tip and they would just walk off. Only because I think your point right there was stupid and wrong. I'm going to follow it up. Otherwise, I would be answering my own question. I think the idea of having to wait three or four days to see how other people react before you do makes and underlines the point I was making before. It's a different culture. Muhammad Ali didn't wait for you know the the president of the United States to weigh in on the Vietnam War before deciding whether or not he was going to show up for the draft. Well, I think the I mean the march on Washington that took some planning that sure. was not d- done but, in less than 24 but hours. But that's not his reaction. He didn't make the goddamn march on Washington. He decided to give up his boxing license by not showing up. You He's, don't know how long it took him to make that decision. I know that it wouldn't have taken these guys very long to decide we are not going to play. And the idea that they had to wait for somebody else to tell them how the league was going to react doesn't make me feel any better about their lack of action. Well, I mean, I started this by agreeing with you. I, I think this <laughs> protest should have been stronger. All right. So I'll, I'll flip back to I appreciate that. that. Now, Getting back to my first goddamn question, I'll make it fast since this segment's going far too long, uh, just like we thought it might. How does this affect it? It's been really strange. In fact, I think it's really affected both teams, and I think it's been a boomerang effect. I think at first, this really helped the Warriors. Before Silver came out, America was rooting for the Warriors. You know, we we all showed up game four. When I was there, the entire stadium was talking about it, and the entire nation was watching. And at that point, the Clippers equaled Sterling. So when the Warriors were playing against him, it was like playing against the KKK. You know, and we all wanted to see the Clippers go down. We felt sorry for the players, but we didn't want to see this organization uh, do well. Silver comes out with his decision. We get ready for last night's game, and the shoe has completely flipped to the other foot. Now the Clippers are America's team. You know, now there's this vindication. Now these guys have got this racist uh, uh, weight off their back. You know, they, they have this whole we are one thing that the entire league is quickly developing. It's remarkable how fast this thing flipped, and in an unbelievably selfish way. I wanted this thing to drag out. I really did. I wanted it to get in their heads. Well, I, I never liked the idea of trying to personally capitalize on a terrible moment like this. Yeah. But if you were going to, I think it was... that. That's one reason why I think it would have been smarter for the Warriors and whoever else they could get on board with it. The idea of, oh, Clippers, you should have done more than just turn yeah. your shooting shirts sure. inside out. Because the more the Clippers had to worry about, oh, are we handling this correct? Right. The more they're not focusing on exactly basketball. Exactly right. I, I think that this had a very unique effect on the people between the lines. We hear about outside distractions all the time. None of them come into the game. Your wife's given a birth to a baby, but your plan... How you play doesn't affect that. Your father just passed away before your plan. How you're playing doesn't necessarily affect that. You have a filthy racist owner who benefits from your wins. Your play directly affects that. Directly. You know, every win they, they go on to, every shirt they sell through their play ends up with money in this KKK bastard's uh, pocket. Yeah, well, you know, and, and they knew it. And, and after the game last night when they interviewed DeAndre, they talked to him about game four. And you could just see in his face and, and for what he said. Yeah that they were demoralized, they didn't know what to do, they exactly. didn't know how to handle it. By the game five, they were in a much better position, oh, yes. and definitely the momentum had swung. 
But I don't, you know, this is basketball. Once a ball's thrown up, we go back to X's and O's and guys executing. Yeah, no, that that's fair. And you know, I mean, predicting how something like this affects someone's game is like predicting traffic. Like, there's so many stupid, small things that can affect where the ball goes and who's shooting well. And you know, it's impossible to kind of separate how they were playing from how they were thinking. But there's no way that this didn't at least play a role in that game four. Now, as far as nasty reactions, let me run something by you. You tell me whether or not I went over the top. Like I told you, we went to game four. I was all fired up to remind the players on the court that this drama was still happening because I wanted to use it to our mental advantage. Which I say, you you shouldn't be doing that. Okay, well then you definitely want to appreciate this. Blake gets to the free throw line. It gets loud, but kind of hushed. I get up and start a racist chant. Racist. And when I say start a racist chant, I mean it was only me and it lasted about five seconds. My wife, crazy embarrassed, pulls me by my shirt brings me down into my seat and lectures me immediately, look, you can't do that. He's not the racist one. And I explain, I just want to get into his head and be ready. If this goes to the fourth quarter and it's close, I'm doing it again. Now, didn't get close. I didn't do it again. Off base? What's your Always, buzz? always listen to your wife, <laughs> number one. Number two, she's completely right. That was totally off base, man. Blake Griffin is not racist. I mean, just to defend myself, you know, home crowds, one of the... Uh, there were so many other things you could have chanted, man. <laughs> One of the things a home crowd is tasked with doing is making it difficult and distracting these guys when they're at their free throw line. We do it in a lot of different ways. We make noise. We raise our hands. We use those noise makers that they give us. We go left and right. You've said that it should be complete silent, whatever, right? This was, I don't, of course, I don't think he's racist. He didn't do anything. But I did think it was a way to distract him from making a free throw. It just turns out it was a fairly inappropriate way to distract him. And I, I don't think any of those distractions ever work. He made both free throws. Yeah. <laughs> uh, other than staying completely silent, that's the only distraction. <laughs> Here that we go. Work. I'm not going back down that. All right. Well, I mean, very interesting stuff. And I wish that I could somehow remind the Clippers that their success is still, uh, it's still give, you know, having some kind of advantage for Sterling. But I don't think I'll get that opportunity. All right, we uh, interesting segment, one I'm sure we've beaten into the ground, especially since anyone who's listening has probably already heard a million takes on it. But nonetheless, man, we had to drop ours. Here's the next concerning thing I need your opinion on, and this is only X's and O's. Um, one of the trends of this series, and it's made really nasty by last night's game, is that Steph is not the assassin we wanted him to be. Before the series started up, you and I had a whole conversation. He's finally found it. He understands that we need him to be taking the shots. And now that the series has started, that's not the case at all. They've made it a distributor. You know, they're double teaming him, and he's allowing that double team to force him into passing off to someone else. Now, right basketball play. You know, he's double teamed. He's finding the open guy. Here's the question, though. Can this team win with Steph as a distributor? I don't think they can to the amount that he's being a distributor. In in other words, he's distributing too much, and he needs to strike a better balance than that. There was a game in his college career where he had zero points, and Davidson won by 30. little Scotty knowledge right there. Um, Is that off the top as well, or did you look that up? Uh, I read that from our boy Diamond Leung. Dropped that in one of his articles. So, you know, the idea that some leading scorer has to necessarily carry the weight scoring-wise, I don't believe in. But I think in in this case, you definitely need him to be doing a lot more. You've said it before. I don't know if it was on the podcast or just talking casually. Curry has been double-teamed all year. This is not something new. So why is it becoming such a problem? You're completely right. I, I will answer the question with a very short answer. No, they cannot win with him as a distributor. Um, in fact, I mean, let's elaborate on that. One, you are allowing the other team to dictate how your best player is affecting the game. But to me, that is unacceptable. But two, when we did the whole playoff preview, and I went on my homer rant about the chances the Warriors had at winning this, the main point that I felt good about was that if Steph is the best player in this series then we have a phenomenal chance to win it. If Steph isn't shooting the ball, if Steph is passing the ball, then he cannot be the best player in this series. But what what about game one? Because game one, they unquestionably won with Steph as a distributor. He did not score many points. He had, I think, 15 assists or something like that. And they won the game. So I do think it's been proven that they can win with Steph as a distributor. I think that there's outliers to every rule. I think game one was that outlier. And I think that we've seen now, I mean, look at last night. He took 10 shots to eight, uh, eight turnovers and we got smashed towards the end because we didn't have someone who can get us over that hump. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the difference right there is game one. The, he didn't have as many turnovers. 
Whereas last night he has eight turnovers and he's not being an effective distributor. So maybe the question should be, can they win with him being an effective non-turnover distributor? I think that if the question is, can they win a game with him being a distributor? The answer is yes, as long as he doesn't turn it over. If the question is, can they win a series with him as a distributor? I still say no. That they're going to need this guy, our cornerstone, our franchise player, our starting all-star, to take the ball and shove it down their goddamn throats. So, I mean, how do you get Curry more free then? Great question. Here's my biggest concern, all right? Here's my fear. Honestly, one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up. I will openly admit to you, Scott, I have no idea. I do not know enough about coaching to get this guy open. But here's the fear. I don't think Mark Jackson knows enough about coaching either. You know, the, it, to watch him passively sit on the sidelines, to watch our best player not get the ball when we need him or to give it up when we need a basket is unacceptable to me. And unless Jackson can figure it out or we can hire an assistant coach to get this thing fixed, I don't know how the hell we can move forward. Well, they did move him off the ball a little more last night. They had Andre kind of running point for a little bit, and they tried to run some sets. The problem is the Warriors get so impatient with running Curry off screens that they dump it down low into some guy, and they never actually let Curry come off the screens. It drives me insane because here you have a shooter who only needs a nanosecond of space to get the shot off. So the idea that an NBA player can't set a good enough screen for Curry to just get a second to get a shot off is very frustrating. It might be the byproduct of losing our best screener. You know, Bo gets out, and he obviously helped a lot in that, but that's been one of the things that keeps screaming to me. You know, I'm watching all these games with uh, Erica. Now, she's a good NBA fan. She goes to a lot of these things, but she doesn't care about the games the way that you and I do, and she watches fairly passively. About 10 minutes into last night's game, she asked me, are they trying to keep the ball out of Steph's hands? You know, and like, she was right, you know, from the from the mouth of babes comes truth. I mean, she was on the money, and it's just killing me. This has got to change, man. And I, I don't know if he needs to force it. I don't know if he needs help. I don't know if he needs screens. I just hope that someone on that, that coaching staff can watch tape and make the difference. Because the good news is, is that even though he only put up 10 shots last night, we were close the entire game. It didn't really get out of hand, and it didn't get into double digits until we started fouling towards the end. So if we can find a little daylight for this guy, I think the series is there, but we got to find it first. Yeah. Good news is, I'm not the only one who thinks that way. Here's Steph. But you only had you only had a few field goal attempts in the, in the first half. You feel like you need to get some up just to get some rhythm going? No, i got to be aggressive and try to find, you know, find looks for sure. I can't. I don't know if I had like four or something like that in the first half. I can't do that every night for us to be successful. I know we know that. Um, so, you know, obviously I knew they were going to come out keying in early in the game because of how, you know, I was able to start last game, you know, game four. But um, it's kind of encouraging to know that I didn't get many shots up, and we still had a chance to win. So if I can find a way to get that done and Gus get stops, we'll be fine in the next two games. Yeah, I think Steph is looking at that game as a glass half full situation because what he's not commenting on is Blake Griffin had a terrible first half. Yeah, Chris Paul didn't really have that effective a first half either. And it wasn't until the fourth quarter that Griffin got going. He hit his first four or five field goals. Sure. So, yeah, they hung around, and it was close all game. But I don't really think it was ever as close as the score was indicating. I felt like they were hanging around the entire time. I hear what you're saying because there's no way you're going to fight. I think Blake was like one of eight at one point. Um, I'm not sure if you just dropped that set. If you did, my apologies. Uh, and you're right. Chris Paul didn't have the effect that they did, and you can't expect that to keep going. Other side to that coin is DeAndre Jordan is not young Shaq. There's no way he continues to do this stuff. By the way, I think I hate DeAndre Jordan, I can certainly tell you that I hate his face. Uh, is there anybody on earth who's more surprised that he got called for a foul? Every single time, it's, oh, I can't believe it, looking around. Yeah, suck it up, DeAndre Jordan. You are a hack, and that is why they're calling you for goddamn fouls. But uh, I'm going to stay optimistic. I'm going to stay that if we can free up Steph, we still have a phenomenal chance in Game 6. But if he has the same quiet night that he did last night on Thursday, the series is over, and uh, they're going to be yeah. going home. A, a big difference from Game 4 versus 5 was Draymond Green was able to play a lot more minutes yeah. in Game 4, and he was the guy in yep. Game 4 who was setting the high pick and rolls for Curry. So you don't get him in foul trouble in Game 6, and you're back to a, a better lineup for the How war. How great is Draymond Green, by the way? He's great, except he the refs seem to hate him 
with a passion I haven't seen since <laughs> Bill Ambeer. He, he has to figure out. We've said this so many times. Bogus going to have to help him. He is a dirty player, which I love, but he's still openly dirty. We're still seeing that all over the place. We can't see that. You know, he's got to learn how to do that on the under. But he seems like he's the only dude who understands playoff intensity. He's the only guy who understands if I'm going to foul, I am going to foul. He's the only guy who doesn't seem intimidated anyway, and he's the only guy who's continuously punishing Blake on the block. If you're going to score on me, fine, but you're going home with some bruises before that happens, you know? Yeah, no, he, he's a great addition. They need him on the floor. He's got to start to do things more subtly or just he had a couple stupid fouls where you just got to realize, look, I got to give this one up. I'm not, I'm not going to foul him. Sure. Cause I'm more, it's more important that I stay in the game. Hell yes. Um, all right, let me drop this thing to you just as long as I'm in Jackson, let me include this. This is the end of game three. Um, you know, we came real close to the game. They lost 98-96. Just to bring it back into your mind, the Warriors have the ball, eight seconds left. They call a timeout. They're taking it from out of bounds. They ultimately give it to Steph. It's one-on-one against uh, Chris Paul, and he misses the three-point shot. Two takes from me. One, probably a foul. Probably. You know, there's been a lot of replays of it. I won't jump down that. If you'd like to, I'd, I'd love your thoughts on it. I'll but just say I disagree. I don't think it was a foul. You didn't think so? I don't think you call that. I, I mean, I, you're not going to call a foul to, to, to dictate the game, so I think you're right. But the thing that pissed me off is that basically at that point, they'd played 12 quarters. Another eight seconds, they played 12 quarters together. The one thing that's been consistent over those 12 quarters is that Steph Curry cannot beat Chris Paul one-on-one. We, we just know that. Every, right. we've, we've known that so many times. Apparently, the, the play that Jackson called was, let's get the ball in Curry's hands, and you beat him one-on-one. Terrible play call. Terrible, man. It's terrible. I, I, I love Jackson. I want to keep him. I think he's a motivator, and I think he can speak to players in a way that no other coach can. But without an X and O's guy, this is not going to work. He needs an assistant coach, which is the perfect bridge towards this next story. Man, you've been following this Ehrman thing? I have, and boy, what a great time for Ehrman to release this story. Yeah, okay. So it just gets buried in the coverage of Sterling. On Brilliant. purpose, you think? I mean, what? What? Why yeah. do they do it that way? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's media management, man. It's perfect. It's the same reason why you, you know, if if you have a bad story about yourself, you release it Friday afternoon and, and hope that it gets buried. Whatever the hell comes. Uh, uh, no, no re- reporters are taken sure. off. You have the weekend here. No one's reading the news the way they do during the week. Well, here's the story. We knew that a few weeks back, Ehrman got fired, and they said that he got fired for violating a team rule, and he would have been fired from any team. But you and I guessed, like, what the hell are they talking about? You know, did, did he come to work naked? I mean, like, what, how could he have violated the rule? Turns out, here's how he violated the rule. Ehrman was allegedly concerned that the other coaches were talking to the players about him behind his back, so he started taping things. More specifically, he started taping Everything He taped every conversation he had. And when he wasn't in the room, he left his phone behind and then taped those conversations. Now, that story on its own, but is super weirdo. But this is coming from an ESPN article written by uh, Zach Lowe over on Grantland. He added a couple of interesting uh, details. And I'm just going to read it so that I, I can't be accused of uh, you know, flaming any of these allegations. Um, one, that the tension quote, tension with Ehrman got weird. Mid-season, the team moved Ehrman's parking spot to a less convenient place, likely at the behest of Jackson or one of Jackson's allies on the staff, per multiple sources familiar with the matter. So they moved this fool's parking spot hella far out. And then two, not having to do with Ehrman, but certainly having to do with Jackson, quote, in addition, Jackson has asked that Jerry West, a high-level advisor in Golden State, not attend most practices and team activities, sources say. What the hell is going on, man? They won't let Jerry West come to the practices? He's moving fools' parking spots away? I don't understand. That is not the leader that I thought Mark Jackson was. That is not the type of atmosphere you want to be promoting right. with your team. Right. You're, you're turning guys who, you know, I imagine that Ehrman has gotten this far, that he's pretty good at what he does. D-League champion. And now all of a sudden... You're turning this dude into some paranoid freakout guy who needs to start tape recording <laughs> conversations. I'm not entirely sure this was all just paranoia, though. Uh, and I turn to you for your theory on this because it, I think he was probably uh, reporting back to Lacob. Yeah, I uh, think he was recording this for Lacob and to try to kind of show what an idiot Mark Jackson is. I think that there's a really good chance of that. Here is why I agree with you. Um, So since this guy got fired, he's ended up in Boston. Now, we got to say that before he came over to the Warriors, he did, in fact, work in Boston. So Ehrman has his own history with him. But you also know that Lacob has a very deep history with Boston. He was one of the owners there before he bought interest here. If, in fact, you know, we're right, 
that Lacob was looking for a reason to fire Jackson, that he turned to Ehrman and asked him to record these things. And then when they caught Ehrman, Ehrman said, oh, no, it was me. I thought that they were just talking behind my back. It would make sense that Lacob would make a few calls, and this guy ends up in Boston. Now, you know, yeah, I, I, I love that theory. Here's another very interesting theory for all those conspiracy theorists out there. Oh, I'm excited to hear this. The, the same article that mentioned the woman who taped Sterling and said that it was uh, an agreed upon taping. Yeah. It also mentions that she did not leak the tape. She had no idea how it got out there. <laughs> in fact, a third person is alleged to have been in the room. Could could that have been Ermin? Yeah. <laughs> did Ermin did Ermin tape this? God, I did hope he, so. Is he the leaker? It turns out that they moved his uh, they moved his parking spot actually all the way to Los Angeles, yes. and he just happened to be taping conversations. I mean, at why, Staples. Why is this coming out at the same time? Why is it coming out? <laughs> we'll because ne- here we'll it is. Never know. No, they they found Ermin's phone. It had the Sterling tapes. <laughs> And it had the locker room. Too. TMZ was like, yes! Like, it all came together for them. Um, I did want to follow up on something that you were saying before, and actually it really dovetails on what the hell we were saying about March Jackson. This idea that there's this weird culture of insecurity in Golden State right now. I, when I said I think all Jackson needs is assistant coach, I mean it. I think all he needs is an X and O's guy. But what these things are saying, the Jerry West thing, the idea that he fired Brian Scalabrino, White Mamba, in front of everybody, the idea that he was apparently housing Ehrman so much that Ehrman felt like he had to tape it, there's one consistent theme, and it's that Jackson's insecure. He doesn't like other people getting credit. It's the same thing we heard about Mike Malone last year, that they had this separation for months and months and months. If that's true, if this guy isn't secure enough to take someone else's advice, then his upside is capped. It's done. He, he will never get those X's and O's. That's not acceptable, man. Just like we were saying for all the things that's brought it up to here. So we've got to see that in him. I mean, I, if you're an assistant coach and they come to you during the offseason, Lakeup's like, look, we're one step away. I'm going to give you all the players you want. you got this great environment. We're building a brand new stadium. You're going to come in and help us move to the championship. How the hell do you look at this last year with fools getting fired left and right and think to themselves, oh, I want to be a part of that. You know, yeah. there's no way. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great point. I think that years down the road, once players get removed from the close proximity and time to, that we are now, yeah. and you interview them about this season, I think there's going to be a lot more said about the fact that there was dissension in the ranks and that the team wasn't quite as cohesive as they needed to be to, to get these playoff victories. Who's the Wizards coach right now? Randy Whitman. Would you prefer Jackson? No. Why? No. Because of what we're saying? I mean, I what's... Mean, yeah, R- Randy Whitman, although not a great track record, yeah, has and now... That's what I was thinking. He's not... Because he gets a lot of... He gets on left and right, and they yeah. didn't get a 51 season. Yeah, but, you know, now they're in the second round of the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they have a really good shot at making it to the Eastern Conference Finals, which I think we need all due praise to the Wizards You should have seen how big this full is smile on his face got when he got to say second round on the playoffs. I'm not talking about that. I'm just that. glad that you brought this up and not me. I don't want to see how far they made it. I just want to know whether or not you wanted Randy Whitman. Nicely done. Congratulations. And in related news, I don't give a single uh, f- Why? Why can't you be happy that my team's <laughs> having some success on the Eastern side? You, why do you have to hate so much? I'm sorry. Have you ever listened to this show? Did you and I just meet? Do I look like just a naturally happy person who celebrates other people's success? Hell no. If my team goes down and yours is in the second round, do you think I'm going to be celebrating? But absolutely not. Not. I mean, the, you could, it doesn't have to be a long time to, you know, some <laughs> type of praise that credit, give credit where credit is due. Here's the credit I will give you. None. But I will ask you something I hope we agree on. Last topic for the show. In my short career of uh, rooting for the NBA and watching these guys go through, I cannot think of another person as talented as Blake Griffin who flops as much as he does. Yeah. I mean, definitely. is it fair? I mean, no. what the hell is going on? Can you ask? Bill Lambeer was, was great. He was the originator of it. And Did he do it as much? Because Griffin looks like every time someone touches him, they smashed acid in his face. He's like, ah, and he starts crying. I, uh, no, L- Lambert didn't do it that much because you look, you know, look back at Citizen Kane, regarded as one of the best movies of all time. Classy I, reverence. I don't, I don't really get it, <laughs> as, you know, because our, the styles and taste have evolved. Sure. So when Bill Lambert was doing it, he was not doing it nearly to the degree that sure. Griffin is doing yeah. it now. He's taking it to a whole new level, like what you said. He realizes that if he flops on any you know shot that he takes, yeah. maybe he'll get a foul. Lambeer was mainly flopping trying to get the charge, right, right. not on offensive plays. I just can't stand someone who prides himself on his physical prowess. Someone who tries to jump over you or through you or bang you to the ground acting like he is. Pick a side. 
You know, you want to be physical, be physical. You want to be slight, be slight. But don't be physical and then bitch when people are physical back. It can't be like that. Um, all right, we play on Thursday. You sticking with your prediction? Warriors and uh, going down in six? Yeah, I think I'm going to be spot on yeah. again. I mean, obviously, I don't know why you use the phrase again. I don't remember the first time you were spot on. Um, I obviously got to stick with mine, Warriors and seven, um, but it's going to be one hell of an uphill battle if Steph only takes 10 shots. All right, huge fun, you guys. Thank you so much for kicking. And before we let you out here, we have kind of a special quote in an effort to uh, toot our own horn, so to speak. Here is Scott and I talking about uh, Donald Sterling way back in episode seven. Again, this was in January of 2013. Mickey Aronson, the owner of the Heat, was fined a half a million dollars for telling somebody on Twitter that they had the wrong owner to criticize about the lockout during the 2011 lockout. Jesus Christ. Again, here's the Sterling quote. He didn't uh, rent to Hispanics because, quote, Hispanics smoke, drink, and just hang around the building. He didn't rent to African Americans because black tenants smell and attract vermin. How is that not way worse than that Twitter tag? It is way worse. And... What makes me so angry is not just Stern, but you haven't seen the NBA Players Association step on this. You haven't seen any NBA players themselves, no coaches. Not even the media has stepped up to the plate to say what the hell is going on here. I feel like if we took the letters in Donald Sterling's name and rearranged them, we could secretly spell out David Duke. This guy is shady as hell, should be held accountable for his filthy racist actions or the alleged filthy racist actions. And I think that it's kind of embarrassing. The fact that Sterling's been around this long and has had no repercussions from this, it's really disappointing. It's ridiculous, and I want all of our listeners to remember this. Every single time we see the Clippers being praised for how good they are this year, every time Mark Schein puts them at number one on his list, every time we hear how they are now legitimate title contenders, I want you to remember that the person behind all that ridiculous success is an apparent and alleged filthy racist bastard. All right, please remember that uh, if you'd like to follow us on Twitter, we are at Warriors Huddle. Our email account is warriorshuddle at gmail.com. The website is warriorsworld.net. And we are on a ton of, uh, I, I'm sorry, on a ton of podcasting services, including iTunes. And honestly, we'd so much appreciate it. If you wouldn't mind going on there, subscribe to us, drop a rating. It would really help us out. Uh, until next week, go Warriors, and uh, we'll see you soon. Good, good.